too many minutes. These people are still coming, yeah? Yeah, he's on the way, yes. He's on the way, yeah? <laughs> Good. <laughs> when I came to Australia, I experienced some problems because I was stressed up to be very punctual on time. And the Dean of Faculty of Engineering, people are always late in Australia. Yeah, yeah always. The uh, Dean of the Engineering says that relax. This is the reason why there are not so many heart attacks in Australia. Yeah? Rushing is not good. Being on time is not good. Slowly. Shall we start? Yes. Okay. So, buenos dias. <laughs> Concentrating on the sensor business. No. Uh, asking questions. Questions today. More questions than yesterday. So, yes, yesterday we discussed surface acoustic wave technology. Two types of transducing platforms. Classic one, standard, with piezoelectric substrates and photolithographically patent interdigital electrodes. The gas sensitive layer deposited between either between transmitter and receiver or in the case of a low conductivity of the sensing layer on the whole surface area. And the second type uh, with intermediate layer, so in this case the sandwich is piezoelectric substrate, intermediate layer, usually zinc oxide layer. Uh, in this case interdigital uh, electrodes are um, immersed into the zinc oxide and on the top if necessary uh, gas sensing layer or zinc oxide itself could act as a sensing layer. In the second case we have a much better energy confinement to the surface so we can expect much higher sensitivity compared to the first type of transducers. And we started to discuss different, uh, different uh, sensors developed based on cell technology. We also discussed different piezoelectric substrates, advantages, mass response, conductometric response, selecting the operating point, and uh, different designs, different designs, also optimization. I believe it was the Okay, this was the last design. So, hydrogen and nitrogen oxide. Where is my laser, laser point? Dr. Alejandro has a laser point, that's right. So it was the hydro hydrogen and nitrogen oxide sensor based on zinc oxide nanobytes layer deposited on either on lithium tantalate or lithium niobate with proper crystallographic cap. So in this case, zinc oxide nanobytes were synthesized by thermal evaporation of solid state powder and uh, uh, nanobelts were pure, and as you can see from XRD pattern, they were structurally uniform and single crystalline, and mostly free from dislocations. 
very good rectangular like cross section with constant dimensions 5.5 nanometers very uniform very uniform dimensions 5.5 nanometers for the zeta nanobars it was the response towards on the left side toward hydrogen at optimized temperature 100 85 degrees centigrade and on the right side response to our nitrogen dioxide <coughs> at, again at optimized temperature 160 degrees centigrade. I mentioned that we can, there are different modes of operation for surface acoustic wave propagation. <coughs> the most widely known is a Rayleigh mode but there are also several others. And many times happens that in a one device, in a one device, we have two or more different modes of operations. So this is welcome because having different modes of operations, we can again employ to design multifunctional sensors. So I will go, I'm going to give you one example. This is layered cell device, layered cell device with lithium niobate substrate, XZ crystallographic plane, and zinc oxide intermediate layer. Before before zinc oxide deposition, there is no laser point because let's wait a second. It will help. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> I should have my own. Good. Excellent. <coughs> so, before zinc oxide deposition, Rayleigh mode, Rayleigh mode was observed. Rayleigh mode was observed with electromechanical coupling coefficient of 2.9. 2.9. After zeta now deposition, additional mode was appearing. It was this shear mode, also called love mode, love mode, with much lower. Electromec electromechanical coupling coefficient of the value of 0 0.1, 0 0.1, so 29 times lower, please. Why is it known as love mode? Why is it called love mode? Because of the name of the inventor. Seems to be, looks, to, sorry for my remark, but I cannot, I have to be honest with you. Rajesh is in a, uh, let's say, keeping smiling. Is she? He's before wedding ceremony. Yeah, you have a <laughs> Rajesh. Concentrate on sensors, <laughs> not on love. Love was the name of the guy who invented this mode. <laughs> Nothing to do with your thoughts. Okay, so we have two modes with different electromechanical coupling coefficients, 2.9, 0.1. As we know that the response of conductometric, conductometric, uh, conductivity-based, conductivity-based, uh, let's come back to one of the previous slides, conductivity based so device it was the uh, equation derived by Rico from Sandia National Lab so as you already know the output signal frequency shift is proportional to the electromechanical coupling coefficient yeah so, looking at this device,
we can expect 29 times larger output signal for rainy mode compared to the shear mode, love mode. Yeah? And this is precisely the case. When we calculated this, it was proven by experiment. Here is a response when we are employing Rayleigh mode. This is a response to nitrogen dioxide gas. And the small one is a response when we are employing shear mode. Much lower response. Comparison between two modes. As I said, playing the game with uh, structure, its dimension, we can deal with different modes. We can generate different modes in a one device. And as a result, we can get, uh, we can, let's say, we can improve the selectivity because it's possible that one of the modes will be useful for one target gas, second one will respond to other target gas. And the response to other target gas present in the gas mixture is much lower which we want to do to achieve. We want to achieve. Please. How many modes can, at max, we can achieve? Maximum? Yeah. Maximum. Realistically, up to three, four. Three, four. In a one device. Because uh, depends on the type of sandwich. Depends on the type of sandwich. How many layers you are employing. So it's, it's this way, in this way we can, we can uh, manipulate, we can tailor the wave propagation. You remember my remark yesterday that the physics of surface acoustic wave device is very well understood, very well understood. So we can do the homework, modeling job before fabrication. And there is a good comparison between theory and experiment. So dealing with surface acoustic wave transducers is a relatively straightforward job because we understand physics very well. Very well. Now, <coughs> The next example, next example, in this case, we have a lithium niobate substrate, XY crystallographic plane, zinc oxide intermediate layer, but we are not using zinc oxide as a gas sensitive layer. We are depositing on the top indium oxide as a gas sensitive layer. Indium oxide as a gas sensitive layer. Indium oxide with two different thicknesses. 40 nanometers and 200 nanometers. And here is a response to nitrogen dioxide for both for devices with two different thicknesses. 40 nanometers and 200 nanometers. Here we have a much stronger response than for 200 nanometers, red, red stuff. And in general, the adsorption of nitrogen dioxide reduces the gas sensitive layer, indium oxide layer's conductivity, resulting in an increase in the acoustic wave velocity, and as a result, its frequency. Here is the comparison, here is the temperature test for different thicknesses. So as you can see, optimized temperature for 200 nanometers thick indium dioxide is about 220 uh, degrees centigrade for uh, for 40 is around 240 degrees centigrade. So even changing the thickness 
we are getting different optimum temperature. Remember my remark that one of the biggest, dis the biggest disadvantage of surface acoustic wave transducing technology is small fractional frequency shift. I mentioned this yesterday. I mentioned this yesterday, that the fractional frequency, fractional frequency delta F to F0 <coughs> for uh, most of the polycrystalline thin films is around 0.1%. So practically, we have a small output signal. Small output signal. I, I delivered the example yesterday then when we are dealing with resonant frequency, let's say around 600 megahertz, the output signal is in a kilohertz range, kilohertz range. So signal processing could be difficult, could be difficult. When you are employing nanostructure materials, you can improve fractional, fractional, frequency shift. For this is for polycrystalline. Polycrystalline materials. And for 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 nano traditional polycrystalline for nano, at least one, up to one order of magnitude higher, fractional frequency shift. So what does it mean practically? It means that the influence of environmental parameters is much smaller. It's much easier to deal with influence of temperature, humidity, and, and, and so on, so on, so on, depending on how many they are in the real environment, which is very substantial improvement. And now I'm going to show you some results with different configuration. This configuration is, again, you have the same substrate. We have a zinc oxide intermediate layer. And on the top, we have a tungsten trioxide as a gas sensitive layer with catalyst, either platinum or gold, either platinum or gold. And <clears throat> we examined response to gaseous hydrogen. When we are employing gold, gold as a catalyst, there result there is response at optimized temperature of 245 degrees centigrade. Uh, the response to what Hydrogen with 1% of humidity, sorry, 1% of hydrogen concentration. Uh, the fractional frequency shift will be over 0.5. Over 0.5. So it's a improvement. And the signal for gold, output signal for gold, will be higher than when we are applying Platinum as a catalyst. Platinum, this combination operates at lower temperatures. Lower temperatures. The optimized temperature is 100 degrees centigrade. But we have a very stable baseline in both cases and a very good response. They are used. This is the usual procedure that first we use AFM in order to do micro characterization job. So first for zinc oxide intermediate layer, AFM surface image of this the combination. So left as deposited and right after thermal treatment, 300 degrees centigrade for more than 24 hours. So after treatment, before left one, we have a grain size, 
in the range 75 to 130 nanometers and the roughness, surface roughness around 18 nanometers. After thermal treatment, grains are larger, 220 to 300 nanometers and the roughness also, also increased to 28 nanometers respectively. For tanks and trioxide sensitive layer, prior to testing, the tank and trioxide grain was 130 to 175 nanometers. After testing, grain size decreased to 9 to 130 nanometers and the roughness the roughness pract practically was similar, 11.512. So very useful, very useful uh, measurements because they are showing us how the morphology changes after uh, thermal treatment and compared to us deposited um, fields. Until now we have a better understanding that they we have numerous options. We can combine we can combine different uh, surface acoustic wave based transducers with different structure with different materials. Semiconducting metal oxides, different semiconducting metal oxides with different catalytic metals as well as uh, we can use conductive polymers, composite materials, carbon nanotubes, graphene. We use graphene at the one side. Three years ago, it was very good, nicely cited paper. Even Novoselcev cited this paper, so it was a good achievement in my laboratory. Now I will show you the example of a room temperature hydrogen sensor based on polyamine nanofiber. Again, we have a, in this case we have a 64 degree lithium niobate substrate, zinc oxide intermediate layer, and on the top polyaniline nanofiber. Polyaniline nanofiber. Here is a dynamic response towards hydrogen at room temperature. You already know that it's very important to sense hydrogen at room temperature. And here we have a frequency shift versus hydrogen concentration. For 1%, the frequency shift is a 3 kilohertz. 3 kilohertz, resonant frequency was 64 64 megahertz. So you have a good understanding that we have a 3 kilohertz output signal, resonant frequency 64 megahertz. So relatively, relatively small output signal. But this result, you remember when I discussed polyaniline, I said that we can use different dopants, different acids. So this result, this result, this 3 kilohertz is for hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid. When we use camphor sulfonic acid, the output signal is 15 kilohertz. So it's five times larger, 15 kilohertz. Again, chemistry is very useful because uh, collaborating with good chemists, with good chemists, we can increase output signal when we are using proper acid. Yeah. This is very interdisciplinary area, again and again. We have to collaborate with others. Yes, please. How does this uh, ratio change when you use a uh, single crystalline sensing film? You mean uh, fin film, no? Yes. Fin film. <coughs> Single crystalline. You know, these examples, these examples, <coughs> some of these examples, we use single crystalline film because zeta nanobells were single crystalline. Mm -hmm. 
single crystal line. So, of course, it depends, but this is the range. This is the range. Okay. According to my knowledge and experience, I never seen that in literature and according to our results that we can get better fractional frequency shift than one percent. But the improvement by one order of magnitude is welcome. It's welcome. It's a substantial improvement. This is one of the advantages of using nanostructure thin films. Nanostructure. So do you expect the, the same result for a continuous single crystalline film than for nanostructure? Single crystalline film? Mm -hmm. I have no such comparison data. I have no such comparison data. <coughs> because you are using here this is electric uh, property. Correct. So Correct. Perhaps you can find different behavior between uh, continuous field and uh, nanostructure. It, it, it must be a difference, but I have no experimental data. I cannot deliver the numbers at this stage. We did not conduct such measurements. No. Any other questions? Not yet. No. So, <coughs> the next, okay, and there is a response. There is a, um, so it was polyani nanofibers. We can also use composite materials. Composite materials, and we use the polyanilin with indium trioxide composite. As you already know, the main reason why people are using these composites is because they are trying to take, in conductometric sensors, trying to take the best from both groups of materials. High sensitivity from semiconducting metal oxides and room operational temperature for, from uh, conductive polymers. So, dynamic response of this composite material deposited on the top, on the top of layered so gas sensors. Again, lithium niobate, YX, 64 degrees, zinc oxide intermediate layer, and this layer on the top. And this is response to what hydrogen gas at 22 degrees centigrade. So, we can get very good sensitivity and room operational temperature. Uh, here we have a uh, response to our carbon monoxide, again at room temperature, very stable baseline, and good sensitivity again, good reversibility, sensor is fully reversible. One of the factors when you are selecting, you remember this table, let's come back to this table for a second. Table comparing, when the comparison of different piezoelectric substrates was made. Here we are. <coughs> One of the factors which must be taken into account is the highest operational temperature for every material used for piezoelectric substrates. And as I said yesterday, quartz has a limitation coming from the alpha-beta phase transition. This limitation uh, means that the maximum operational temperature is 573 degrees centigrade. This is key point when quartz loses he, its piezoelectric properties. Uh, when the deposition temperature is higher than 573, we cannot employ quartz. We also cannot employ lithium tantalate, lithium niobate, zinc oxide. So I said that 
solution is the relatively newly developed material, free to crystallographic class, the same as quartz, and uh, uh, melting point 1470 degrees centigrade. When the temperature deposition is very high, we should use we should use langasite. But langasite has a one disadvantage, low electromechanical coupling coefficient, around 0.1. So when we are dealing with conductivity, with the conductivity of the gas sensitive layer changes, when the sensor is based on the conductivity change, surface acoustic wave sensor, we cannot expect high output signal. Again, trade off trade-off, as usual in sensor technology. So, we use this langasite substrate in order to design, in order to deposit carbon nanotubes. Deposition temperature was slightly over 600 degrees centigrade. Here we are. So this is the example of Langasite so gas sensor with self-assembled carbon nanotube functional layer. So this assembling was obtained by means of radio frequency plasma enhanced chemical uh, vapor <coughs> deposition process. And the deposition temperature was higher than 600, uh, slightly higher than 600. This is the response to our hydrogen at optimized temperature 300 degrees centigrade. So you have to be fully aware that selection of materials, one of the limits is also, there are also factors coming from deposition technique used. Deposition technique used. Namely, deposition temperature and deposition time. But novel materials offer us uh, certain advantages. There is a team in Europe, Penza team, in Italy. We are collaborating with them. They are very good in uh, carbon nanotubes. So Penza team, Penza team developed uh, organic vapor, organic vapor uh, sensor based on cell technology. They embedded single wall carbon nanotubes into the cadmium arcadite matrix. It was the host matrix from cadmium arcadite. Here we have a uh, SEM and TEM images for this carbon nanotubes and the dynamic response of narrow composite material towards ethanol. Towards ethanol. Different concentration of ethanol. Uh, the sensitivity the sensitivity was very high towards ethanol vapor much higher than previously used techniques. Very good result, very good result. They use, they use langmuir blodgett deposition technique. They have these facilities at the laboratory. Now, we will go to different uh, uh, transducing technique, which you know very well, here in Sinvestav, which is Schottky. Schottky. As I already said, and you know it very well, Schottky is a very powerful technique because it allows us to get, first, to get very high output signal without signal processing, and second, short key when you are when you are using the proper substrates, 
you can design sensors operating at very high temperatures, which is vital, for instance, for automotive industry. Hydrogen sensors operating at temperatures 800, 900 degrees centigrade. You, in this case, you have to employ you have to employ wide band gap semiconductors instead of a silicon. And uh, uh, such a like silicon carbide, the energy band gap is 4.2 electron volts or gallium nitride, also very high energy band gap. So, mm -hmm. short key. <laughs> This is the example uh, when carbon, uh, cobalt oxide was deposited on silicon carbide substrate and platinum, platinum disc on the top. On the back side, ohmic contact. <coughs> IV characteristics, IV characteristics in Synthetic air, the brown one, <coughs> response toward shift. You can see clearly shift toward hydrogen with 1% concentration and shift of this characteristic towards protein with 1% concentration. And dynamic response to protein. Very stable baseline. And uh, uh, very strong output signal in the order of single volts, single volts without amplification. This is the example of relatively simple approach, simple approach with great results, great results. What we have here. Here we deposited mixed titanium, titanium tungsten uh, ox oxygen on silicon carbide substrate and platinum as a catalyst, as a catalyst, and at the same time as a disc, as a disc for connecting wires. So the mixed oxide such a mix oxide thin films, they were, de were deposited by RF sputtering and typically 100 nanometer thick layer. Again, the dynamic response to propping at 420 degrees centigrade, strong output signal and very good repeatability. Here is a, we tested response in different, in the cases when the gas chamber was filled with different, uh, uh, let's call them baseline, baseline gases. First, response to one percent, hydrogen with one percent concentration in synthetic air. When we are changing synthetic air by nitrogen, the response of the, the same structure toward hydrogen with 1% concentration, the red one, is much higher than in a synthetic air. Much higher in the synthetic air. This experiment shows you clearly that response depends on particular gas mixture. Yeah? Different for synthetic air than for then for nitrogen. And uh, in this case, we got a very large shift in voltage. So IV characteristic shift, and we use constant current mode of operation. So the transfer characteristic was voltage shift versus concentration. Uh, this large shift, we believe, was mostly caused by the total change in the ambient atmosphere of oxygen in nitrogen to hydrogen in nitrogen gas. In addition, both 
oxygen and hydrogen act as oxidizing and reducing gases respectively. In contrast, when the target gas of one per, hydrogen with 1% concentration was introduced in synthetic air, a voltage shift was approximately only 700 millivolts. But again, without amplification, so it's a good substantial output signal. This technique is simple, but very, very powerful. Coming back to our discussion, we cannot use the term cheap because you have to buy silicon carbide. I have uh, information regarding silicon carbide wafers, so you can buy them very quickly. And, uh, but it, this simple and very powerful technique. And in this table, we compared different metal oxides deposited on a, on a uh, silicon carbide, gallium oxide, tungsten, titanium, molybdenum, cobalt, this mixed oxide discussed just a second ago. And we compare response to hydrogen in air and to, I've forgotten what is the chemical formula, is a propene or propane? C3H6. Propene. 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 In air, again. So, in some cases, look for this mixed oxide, voltage shift 2.6, 2.6 volt. 2.6 volt, or for cobalt oxide, 2.3 volt for uh, 1%. For hydrogen, uh, this oxide offers 1.15 volt shift. So, my suggestion is, it's a funny story, I tell you something, practically, what we observe, all semiconducting metal oxides and all conductive polymers are responding to hydrogen. Yeah? So we can try, hopefully, to deposit Rajesh zinc oxide on silicon carbide. And we can test the response to both gases in propene in propane and uh, to propane and to hydrogen in my lab, yeah? Mm -hmm. And my advice is you can install your hi own hydrogen with concentration up to 1%. There is no safety issues. Mm -hmm. We can also try, but we'll discuss this after, after lunch. I mentioned yesterday that this Four types of transducers, conductometric, bulk wave, QCM, surface acoustic wave, and shot key. They are not all available options because there are several other transducers which could be used. Of course, in my opinion, the best at this stage of development in development in nanotechnology, the most promising are optical. Optical. But you can also use misfits, different type of misfits. You can use different different uh, transducers and combining them with different materials you can obtain fascinating results. So, the conclusions for this part of the lecture that new generation of sensitive, reversible uh, sensors in general, acoustic sensors, conductometric, shot key, is being developed for different, for different gases, oxygen, uh, ozone, Nitrogen oxide, carbon, carbon oxides, gaseous hydrogen, volatile organic compounds. 
Again, selectivity. Selectivity is the biggest issue in chemical sensing field. Selectivity. We have to get good selectivity. And as I already discussed, there are two approaches. One approach is to work closely with chemists to des design the proper filters. So only target gas is approaching the nanostructure thin film. Others are eliminated by the filter. And gas uh, manufacturing, sensor gas manufacturing companies are widely using this technique. Usually they are in a business of making money, not in the business of publishing papers. So they are not publishing their results regarding filters. So as a result, university people have a difficult time. The second option is to use, to functionalize surface, functionalize surface. And when discussing several materials, I mentioned, I mentioned that several gas sensitive nanostructure materials, they have a very well established functionalization techniques. Among them, among them, semiconducting metal oxides, practically all of them, but especially carbon nanotubes, both single and wall carbon nanotubes, graphene, composite materials with graphene, also uh, conductive polymers. So when we are functional, function, when we are using the proper functionalization technique, we can improve selectivity. And the most elegant option, the most elegant option, is to fabricate the sensor array. Sensor array. So when we are dealing with a gas mixture containing, let's say, nine <coughs> components, nine components, we have to build the array. Employing the same type of transducer and using nine different gas sensing materials, each of them deposited on particular transducer of the R. The next step is to calibrate each of the sensors separately, individually, calibrate one of them, one of them, for instance, to carbon monoxide. Because we are dealing with gas mixture composed of nine different gases. So each sensor in the array is calibrated individually toward these gases. This one, let's say, toward carbon dioxide. This one toward nitrogen oxide. This one toward nitrogen dioxide. This one, let's say, toward oxygen, and so on, so on. So we are obtaining nine calibration curves. Nine calibration curves. And now we are coming, we are going to employ the neural network concept in order to design, this concept is used by our brains. This is the reason why we are able to selectively, selectively sense different aromas, and we can selectively sense different tastes. As I already said, our olfactory system is not as perfect as other living creatures, because they have much more sensitive olfactory system. The best example, they are dogs, drugs, tracking dogs in the airports. Their olfactory system is much more sensitive than ours, but they are using the same neural network concept. And we are employing this concept in order to design intelligent sensor, intelligent array of sensors. So we are employing commercially available pattern recognition software 
we have to spend some money. And as a result, we are getting Korea's, we are getting, as you remember from my plenary talk, we are getting, we are getting, for instance, in linear discriminant analysis space, we are getting well separated, well separated results toward nine of these gases present in a gas mix. <coughs> So in this case, in this case, selectivity is very, very good. And this is done by people who are commercializing electronic noses, widely used in food industry, as well electronic tongues, again used in a food industry. Okay? So let's make a break and we'll continue after the break. Okay?